Okay, so today's lecture is going to continue from last week's. We were doing model theory and looking at um, different kinds of morphism maps between structures. Um, but today is going to be more applied, really. So we're going to have one main theorem that is going to complement the last theorem um, from last week. But most of the lecture is going to be looking at two different ways in which the theorem um, can be can be applied. So in order to get to what I'm going to do first is, is state the theorem, but in order to get there, I'm going to remind you of the main concepts from last week, uh, just rather quickly. Um, so the main notion of morphism that we introduced between structures uh, was the notion of elementary embedding. That's the most important one from the point of view of logic. Um, so remember, a function theta on the underlying set, between the underlying sets of two structures, um, so between structures, so those are the underlying sets and the structures are going to be curly M and curly M prime. And remember that that's an um, elementary embedding. So this is the definition from last week. If this function preserves first order properties. So if for every formula A, if the formula A holds in the structure M under environment rho and environment rho in M, in curly M and environment rho. If A holds in M under rho, then it also holds in M prime under, well, we take the elements of M to M prime via theta. So under the environment we get by composing theta with rho. Okay, so that was a key definition from last week. And just to remind you that we can replace that with if and only if, and that's equivalent, because the logical because logical formulas are closed under negation, the implication in one direction also implies the implication in the other direction. So equivalently, we replace that with if and only if. Okay, so that was the notion of elementary embedding. And from this, we also had last week that homomorphisms, sorry, elementary embeddings are in particular homomorphisms, indeed not just homomorphisms, but homomorphisms that also they just preserve properties, but reflect atomic properties, that's embeddings. So elementary embeddings. are in particular homomorphisms. So when I was started to introduce these notions of function between structures, I started with homomorphism, I then went to embedding, and then I went to elementary embedding. The elementary embedding is a stronger notion, so it implies the other two, homomorphisms and embeddings. So that was We also, once we've got homomorphisms, we've got the notion of isomorphism between structures. So namely a homomorphism that has an inverse homomorphism. Um, remember I remarked last week, isomorphisms are always elementary embeddings. And then we had a special class of elementary embeddings, which are ones where you have a substructure of another structure and the inclusion map between them 
is an elementary embedding. Um, so and that so that was called an elementary substructure. Substructure M of M prime. I don't remember which way around I had the primes last week, it doesn't matter. Um, is an elementary structure, is an, is an elementary substructure. If the inclusion map is an elementary embedding. So M is an elementary substructure of M prime if D is a substructure. So it's just there's an underlying, the underlying set is a subset, and the interpretation of the function symbols and predicate symbols restrict to the um to the structure M. So we say an elementary substructure of the occlusion preserves the first order properties, so is an elementary embedding. Um so that's putting the focus on M. M is an elementary substructure of M prime. We can turn the focus around and we can say M prime, and the appropriate terminology then is an elementary extension of M. Okay, so the word for if M is a substructure of M prime, we say M prime is, is an extension of M. We also say that M prime is an elementary extension extension of M. Find that. So that might, that's potentially the first new thing for this week. It's just a bit of terminology. I don't quite remember whether I did that last week. Um, and in both cases, we write this, this kind of curly less than or equal symbol to say that M is an elementary substructure of M prime, or equivalently, that M prime is an elementary extension of M. Okay, so that's revision of the terminology um, from last week and the main definitions. You might remember that a key result we had last week at, at the end of the lecture was what I called, I think, the countable elementary substructure theorem, which if we started off with an infinite structure, and we identified a countable subset of it, we could find a countable elementary substructure of the starting infinite structure that contained the identified subset as a subset of, of the domain of the new sub, of the countable substructure that we're constructing. But the point is, from a large structure, one's carving out a substructure, an elementary substructure of it, and one can make that elementary substructure countable. So cutting a large structure down to a smaller substructure. The main result today is going in the other direction. We're going to start with a um, smaller structure and embed it in a larger structure via an elementary embedding. Um, so let's move the camera. Are we going to embed it in such a way that the larger structure is different from the structure we start with? Otherwise, it would be an uninteresting embedding. Um, so we're not just making a trivial extension. It really is a, di a different structure that we're building over the starting structure. Um, so to do that, I'm going to introduce the notion of a proper elementary embedding. So. That's very easy. An elementary embedding beta is proper. So actually, often I'm going to write beta from curly M to curly M prime, meaning beta is an elementary embedding from the structure curly M to the structure curly M prime. Of course, such a thing is actually given by a function theta on the underlying set. So that goes from ordinary, ordinary font M to ordinary font M prime. Um, but anyway, so still I'll write it like this. An elementary value from the structure M to the structure M prime is proper 
It's the function, the underlying function. Theta on the underlying sets from the underlying set of M to the underlying set of M prime is not surjective. It just there's something in M prime that isn't in. Remember, remember that an elementary embedding always needs to be an injective function. So you've got some, some copy of the structure M inside M prime, and we're making sure that that copy is not the whole of M prime. And the main theorem today is Hi, Alex, sorry. Um, the proper, what I call the proper elementary extension theorem. Oh, we're very out of focus. Let me check my notes for how I formulated it. Um, so it says if we have an infinite structure, we can always find a larger structure into which there is into which it has an elementary embedding. So simply if curly M is an infinite structure. then it has a proper elementary extension M prime such that, well, actually the main thing is just that, it has very, for any infinite structure, you can find the proper elementary extension of it, Moreover, if M and the signature are both countable, then M prime can also, then the, then the proper elementary extension can also be taken to be countable. Let's put box around that because it wasn't theorem. So a couple of things to clarify. What do I mean by proper elementary extension? Well, I simply mean an elementary extension. So that is a larger structure of which M is a substructure such that it's an elementary extension. Um, so the inclusion function is an elementary embedding, and that inclusion function is proper. So in other words, it's simply a larger a structure M prime that has the underlying set of M as a proper subset, and such that it's an elementary extension of M. Okay. So last week we were cutting down an infinite structure M to a smaller substructure that was an elementary substructure. Today we're starting with an infinite structure M and we're extending it to a larger structure in such a way that the properness here means that we're definitely putting something new into the larger structure. Okay, so this is today's main theorem. It's actually not very hard to prove. Before proving it, I want to give an application of it to, to, kind, to kind of motivate it and so we understand what's going on. Um, and then after proving it, I'm going to give a different application. But before doing any of that, I want to just talk a little bit about the proper elementary extension theorem that I'm going to prove in contrast with the last week's countable elementary substructure theorem. 
and tell you just a little bit about how such results normally appear in the logic literature, because um, like once again, this is not standard terminology, this proper elementary extension theorem. Last week's, um, last week's countable elementary substructure theorem is also not standard terminology. In, if you look in logic textbooks, what you normally get are two theorems called the, um, the one for last week, the downwards, and the one for this week, the upwards, levenheim theorem theorems. So last week, we did the levenheim skolem theorem in its original form, which was simply saying that if you have a consistent theory in, um, in a countable signature, that it, then it has a countable model. That was the levenheim skolem theorem we did last week. I just want to, it's not really an examinable part of the course, but just to orientate you with respect to the logic literature, I just want to briefly tell you what the, the standard results that one has in logic textbooks are, called the downwards and, uh, and upwards levenheim skolem theorem, which are versions of the results we had last week and the result that we got this week. So this is like a little detour for the course. So the, um, the upwards and downwards levenheim skolem theorem. And we'll start off with the downwards, which is the version last week. That is the theorem. The theorem that one normally gets in the logic literature that is um, that one normally sees in the logic literature that's related to our result from last week. So the downwards Lerbenheim Skolem theorem. Let's get a different pen for it. Um, so if I prepared this on the separate sheet, so let's think of how to word it. Um, so the usual formulation is this. If you have an infinite structure, and let's, let's say what the signature is. So L is the signature that we've got. So, We've got the infinite structure for some signature L. And kappa is an infinite cardinality. With um, the cardinality of the signature. So simply, if you take a collection of all predicate symbols and function symbols all together, what is the cardinality of that connection? That's the cardinality of the signature. Um, and if we have the cardinality of L, the kappa must be at least the cardinality of the signature and less than the cardinality of the underlying set, sorry, less than equal to the cardinality of the underlying set of the structure, then there exists an elementary elementary substructure of early M with cardinality kappa. So basically what it's saying, if you have an infinite structure, then you always have a structure of a, an elementary substructure of any smaller cardinality, infinite cardinality, as long as that cardinality is at least as large as the cardinality of the signature. Okay. This is the usual formulation. It doesn't say the usual formulation doesn't say anything about including a particular set, but nonetheless, it is possible to build that into the theorem too if you want to. So that's the downwards levenheim skolem theorem, finding substructures. The upwards one, so i just write LS theorem. Well, I'm just going to put in circle in red the bits that change. So the point now with the upwards one, so the downwards one is saying we can always build smaller substructures. The upwards one is going to say we can always build larger extensions. 
So to build larger extensions, we need kappa to be greater than or equal to m, but it still needs to be as large as the signature. So we replace the conditions here with the um, the maximum cardinality of L and and the starting structure M is less than or equal to kappa. And instead of elementary substructure, we have elementary extension. So I won't write the rest down, but I'll just read it and it would read. So if M is an infinite L structure and kappa is an infinite cardinality that's at least as large as the maximum of the starting structure and the signature, then there exists an elementary extension of M with that, card with that infinite cardinality kappa. So for any larger cardinality than, than M, um, I don't, don't need to say infinite because that's actually implied by this, um, by this condition here, but for any larger cardinality, we can find an elementary extension with that cardinality. Okay, so this is what you normally see in a logic textbook. The reason I don't want to, to, to use the usual formulations in this course is, firstly, they're very tied down to cardinalities. So in this course, I'm not assuming you know a whole lot about set theoretic cardinalities. Secondly, the, I mean, from my point of view, these usual formulations miss some of the important points. So what I think is really important about the elementary extension theorem is that you can always find a proper elementary extension. And that's what's going to be really useful in the applications. Of course, with the upwards lovenheim skolem theorem as ordinarily formulated, it guarantees you have a proper elementary extension because you just take a higher cardinality for your underlying set. And then if it's, you've got an elementary extension of a strictly larger cardinality, that the embedding is forced to be proper. But the point is, using what I think is the nicer formulation, it emphasizes that the proper elementary extension can be the same cardinality. In particular, if we start up an accountable structure, then we get a proper elementary extension that's still countable. Anyway, so that's just a little, some comments about sort of how the way I'm presenting things differs from what you normally see in the literature. So before the break, I mean, the, the, the first thing I'm going to do, which is going to take quite a while because it's a substantial application, is to look at an application of the proper elementary extension theorem. So before the break, I'm going to set the scene by telling you what the application is. And then after the break, we'll see how logic helps with um, how the concepts from the lectures help with this application. And as I said, there are going to be two applications in the lecture. Um, this first one, I think it's a nice illustration of how logic can be used in ordinary mathematics, but the use of logic is not really very necessary in the sense that I'm going to give proofs of some results from combinatorics and the logic can totally be eliminated from the proofs. You just get, in a sense, slightly more complicated proofs if you eliminate the logic. Um, in a sense, I mean, I'll talk about that later. But the second application I'm going to talk about is one where the logic is, which we'll do at the end of the lecture, is one where the, the logic is absolutely essential, the use of logic. Um, but anyway, let's do the first application first. As I say, it's to do with combinatorics combinatorial mathematics. And it's going to concern results that probably many of you know, or, or at least have heard of. So I'm going to look at using these model, the model theoretic notions from last week's lecture and also this proper elementary extension theorem to prove a very famous theorem in combinatorics uh, called Ramsey's theorem. So just hand, hands up if you know Ramsey's theorem. Not, not so many people. It's a really beautiful result, very simple result to state. I'm actually going to, going to change this title in just a moment, but for the moment let's state 
Ramsey's theorem. So Ramsey's theorem says, and let me just see, I want to stick to my notes and I, re I remember I use N and K, but I don't remember which way round they are. So let me... Right. So for any... For any K greater than equals one, there exists some number N, which is also a natural number. Well, in, in my notes, I say greater than equals one, so let's keep that. Um, such that, but it's going to be a lot greater than or equal to one anyway, such that every graph of size greater than equal to, well, to be clear what I mean by size, I mean with this number of vertices, so with at least n vertices, either has a k clique or a k anti clique. Hands up if you know what a clique in a graph is. Okay, most people. Um, I think there's another word for it, something set, uh, but I've forgotten what the adjective is. Maybe someone can remind me. Um, but um, so, so e.g. a four clique, clique with you also talk about cliques of people. Cliques are like groups of people that know each other well and are a bit exclusive to outsiders. Um, but a four clique in the graph, a, a clique is a set of vertices. Let's do a five clique instead, because it's more. A clique is a set of vertices in the graph such that every pair of distinct vertices amongst them is connected by an edge. So. Well, I, I wish I'd done four because then I would have fewer lines to draw. Uh, uh, oh, goodness. It's the sort of thing, if you do it by illustration, you can actually get it wrong. Uh, I hope that's a clique, but if anyone can see a missing edge, then, then let me know. So the point is you have a set of vertices and each of them, each, they're pairwise connected to each other. An anti-clique is the opposite. You have a set of vertices and none of them are connected to each other. Or another way of looking at that is if you consider the dual graph, where you put edges only where there weren't edges in the first graph, then it's a clique in the dual graph. So a five, um, a five anti-clique is easier to draw because it's, you don't have any, you have five, five vertices and there aren't any edges between them. And what this theorem says is for any number of, for any size of clique or anti-clique, there's a certain number beyond which if you have that many vertices in the graph, you're guaranteed to have at least one of, an, of a clique or anti-clique of that size. And um, people often use a, a kind of party metaphor for this, but if you have if, if you have n if you if you have a party with at least n people, then you're guaranteed to have at least at least either k people that all know each other in the party that would be a clique, or k people that don't know each other, but none of whom know each other in the party that would be an anti clique. And this is a beautiful result by Frank Ramsey from the nineteen the nineteen twenties. Um, it's very combinatorially interesting. So when K is three, a, 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 a three clique is just a triangle in a graph. And when K is three, the smallest N that, will, that is guaranteed to have either a triangle or three separate vertices that's not connected, the smallest N is six. So you can, it's easy to find a, a five vertex graph that neither has a triangle nor an anti-triangle in it. 
that if you have a, a graph of with six vertices, then you then you are guaranteed to either have a triangle or an anti-triangle. That's not so difficult to prove. It's also known for k equals four, but the smallest n such that you're guaranteed to have a four clique or a four anti-clique is 18. That's and that requires quite a lot of proof. I think that was done well, sort of early 1980s or something like that. I don't quite remember. But anyway, people managed to establish that. For n for k equals five. The smallest, the, the precise value of the smallest number n, such that a five clique or a five anti clique exists, is not known. That's an open question. It's known to be bounded between something like 44 and 48 or something. I don't, I don't quite remember. It's around that anyway, but nobody knows the exact number. So it's, it's rather a deep property. It's hard to get one's hand on combinatorially. Nonetheless, this is a, a nice theorem about graphs. So there's actually another version of this theorem concerning infinite graphs. So we call this the infinite Ramsey theorem. The infinite Ramsey theorem simply says every infinite graph as either an infinite clique or an infinite anti -clique. Um, so that's the infinite Ramsey theorem. So because we've got an infinite one, I'm going to rename Ramsey's theorem and call it the finite Ramsey theorem. And um, what we're going to do after the break is we're going to first show that Using the compactness theorem for logic from last week, it's easy to prove that the finite Ramsey theorem follows as a consequence of the infinite Ramsey theorem. So that might seem a funny thing to do, but anyway. But this theorem is a, is a, is a consequence of the in, infinite Ramsey theorem, the finite one. But a nice thing about that is that the infinite Ramsey theorem is actually easier to prove than the finite Ramsey theorem. So having reduced the infinite Ram the finite Ramsey theorem to the infinite Ramsey theorem, we have a nice direct proof. We can give a nice proof of the infinite Ramsey theorem. Moreover, the infinite Ramsey theorem is particularly nice to prove using the proper elementary extension theorem. So we're going to use, so basically the whole of probably the next period is going to be proving these two theorems. Showing the finite Ramsey theorem is a consequence of the infinite Ramsey theorem using compactness and then using the proper elementary extension theorem to prove the infinite Ramsey theorem. Um, did I already ask you, how, how many of you, yeah, I did ask how many of you have known, have seen Ramsey's theorem before, and like about three or four of you put your hands up. Um, there is, there may be something different. Does anyone see, I mean, I mean even in the finite Ramsey theorem, uh, we took it as a full graph, and then you looked at columns. We yeah. So yeah, but it's quite obviously comparable, I guess. So. Yeah. So so often you look at coloring. So one of the things I haven't done here. This is not as general as the usual Ramsey theorem. So often you have, and actually, one quite often uses k for that. But anyway, never mind. Uh, you have some other number m involved. Let's say. And rather than looking for cliques or anti-cliques, you look at ways of colouring the graph in M colours. And, um, and this is the two-colour version of that version of Ramsey's theorem. And actually, the techniques I'm going to say extend to the general version involving colouring. I'm just keeping it at this level just to make it simple for the lecture. OK, um, any questions? Good. So. Uh, Hang on. Oh, 
I'd been confused by the clock on the back wall. Um, so I was sort of judging things to have a break because we were getting to the hour. But actually, I see we're getting to completely the wrong hour. But, uh, does anyone mind having an early break? I'm, I'm sorry, it seems... I, yeah, I'm, uh, I was really confused by that clock. So, uh, um, But I think now I've sort of got to this point, so let's have a 15-minute break and start again at quarter past 12 by the clock on the back wall. Um, for and for people on Zoom, that's in 15 minutes' time from now. Right, so what, what I want to begin with, and it's going to take most of the next period, um, as a proof of these two theorems. First, we're going to prove that the um, infinite Ramsey theorem implies the finite Ramsey theorem. And then that's going to be straightforward. It's a simple application of the compactness theorem of logic that we did last week. And having done that, then it remains to prove the infinite Ramsey theorem. So the first bit of proof is infinite Ramsey theorem implies finite Ramsey theorem. Right, so let's assume the infinite Ramsey theorem. We want to prove the finite Ramsey theorem. So we want to prove that any k greater than or equal to 1, there exists some n that any graph with at least n vertices will have either a k clique or a k anti -clique. So. Um, but let's consider some arbitrary k greater than equal to 1. We want to prove there exists an n with the properties I just said. So we're going to, as I've already said, use the compactness theorem. And to do that, I'm going to write a little theory using sentences of first order logic. So we're going to consider the set of sentences over the signature that, just like last week, or the week before, or whenever it was recently, it was last week, when we were considering a signature for graphs, we just had one binary relation symbol E for the, um, namely the relation that is true of X and Y if you know, X has an edge to Y, the variables range over vertices. And now, the set of sentences I'm going to call it S over the signature E, and our set of sentences is going to simply say we're going to have the same sentences as last week, saying that our, our models are graphs. So we say there's not an A for all X. So we, we had exactly this last week. For all X, there's not an A from X to X, no vertex as, an, as a loop to itself. For all X and Y, um, it is an edge from X to Y, that's the same thing as there being an edge from Y to X. So this was the, this was the, what we called TG last week. So this simply says a model is a graph. Um, but I want a little bit more in the, in the set of sentences. I want to have a theory that says I am a graph and I don't have any k cliques and I don't have any k anti cliques. So I can say I don't have a k clique by saying it's not true that there exists there exist elements vertices x1 to xk that form a clique. So to say form a clique, well, that's for all pair, all distinct pairs of such vertices, there is an edge between them. So in other words, for all, if we do the conjunction for i's ranging between 1 and k, similar, similar things to what we've done in other situations, and we do a conjunction for j's strictly between i and k. Um, so this is a conjunction over j's. 
I don't know. I think maybe I should write this in the standard bulk. So this goes from i goes from one to k, and j goes from i plus one to k. So if we want to say it's not true, but there exists a clique, so it would be a clique if for this conjunction there isn't always an edge between xi and xj. And we want to say it's also not true that there exists a k anti clique. So we say that in a similar way. Not true that there exists x1 to xk, such that again, conjunction i equals 1 to k, conjunction from j is i plus 1 to k. So of course, we now want to say that any distinct pair of xi, xj, there is no edge between xi and xj. So it's not true that there exists an edge from xi to xj. Um, so without the negation here, I want a formula that says x1 to xk form an anti clique I put some space in here because I can't simply, it's not enough to simply say there's not an edge from x i to xj. Can somebody see what's missing? We want to say, so missing out this bit, we want to say x1 through to xk form an anti, form a k anti clique form a size k anti clique If we just simply say for every pair of, of x1 to x, variables x1 to xk, there's not an edge between them. It's still being, it's still so yeah, some of them could be equal. But in this case, we didn't need to say xi and xj are distinct, because that's implied by saying there's an edge between xi and xj. That's um, due to this axiom up here. But here we need to say, very good, that xi is not equal to xj and this. So anyway, so this, I don't have space for writing the notes here, but this says there exists a k clique. And sorry, it's, it's not true there exists a k clique. And this says it's not true that there exists a k anti clique. Right. So with this theory, it's very straightforward now because we want to show that the infinite Ramsey theorem implies that the, the finite Ramsey theorem for this particular k. So, um, it's very straightforward. So, let me look at my notes. Right. Okay. So let me let me write what I've already said. So the models of S of S are um, graphs that have no no k clique and no k anti clique. By the infinite Ramsey theorem, the infinite Ramsey theorem says every infinite graph has either an infinite clique, or sorry, either has an infinite clique or an infinite anti clique. So, in particular, it has, if it has an infinite clique, it certainly has a k clique, or if it has an infinite anti clique, it certainly has a k anti clique. So, by the infinite Ramsey theorem, the theory S has no infinite models. So, by by the infinite Ramsey theorem, S has no infinite models. But last week we had a theorem that was a consequence of compactness that said if a theory has arbitrarily large finite models, then it has an infinite model. So we, S does not have an infinite model. Therefore, by last week's theorem, it cannot have arbitrarily large finite models. But by, by last week's results, results, the first consequence of compactness, first consequence of 
packed in this. Um, S does not have arbitrarily large So if S does not have arbitrarily large finite models, that simply means there exists a number beyond which S has no, a finite number beyond which S has no finite models of that cardinality. So IE, that is, there exists N such that S has no finite models of size greater than equal to n. But if S doesn't have a model of size greater than equal to n, that means that there is no graph with greater than equal to n vertices that is a model of S. So there's no such graph in which it's true that there doesn't exist a K clique and there doesn't exist an at the K anti clique. In other words, any such graph must have either a K-clique or a K-anti-clique. Um, so N is the, the required number. Because any graph is greater than equal to N vertices is not a model of S. Well, if it fails to be a model of S, the only things it can fail is a graph. So it doesn't fail the first two axioms. So it either fails that there doesn't exist a K clique, in other words, it does, or it fails that there doesn't exist a K anti clique. So it's not a model of S, hence has either a K clique or K anti clique. Okay, so I maybe gave more details than I needed to there, um, but uh, I think the idea behind this proof is very nice. Using compactness to reduce to produce a result in finite combinatorics from a result in infinite combinatorics. So the compactness theorem is a sort of powerful tool here. But saying from some sort of result about infinite abstract things, we get actually a result about finite structures and natural numbers. I think that's very beautiful. Um, so we've done the first thing, we've proved the infinite Ramsey theorem, this version of it, about cliques and anti-cliques. Sorry, no, we haven't. We've proved that the infinite Ramsey theorem implies the finite Ramsey theorem. So now what we want to do is prove the infinite Ramsey theorem. Okay. Um, so I'm going to clear the board to that. Are there any questions on the while I'm while I'm clearing the board? Anything? My line in the middle. Okay, so I'm just going to dive straight in. Um, so proof of the infinite Ramsey theorem. And by diving straight in, I mean, let's take some infinite graph and we want to construct within it either a K bleep so, so no, we won't, we're trying to find either an infinite clique or an infinite anti-clique. So we, are, we want to construct within it either an infinite clique or an infinite anti-clique. We want to show that one of those two things exists. So let G 
Um, let's write it like this, a set of vertices and a set of edges be an infinite graph. And I'm going to sort of not make the logic very explicit here, but I'm going to talk you through the logical side. So from the logical perspective, we want to view this as a structure. So it's got an infinite underlying set, V, the set of vertices, and E is the edge relation. So this is a structure for our signature with one binary relation. It's an infinite structure. So by the elementary by the proper elementary extension theorem, the graph has some proper elementary extension. So by the proper elementary extension theorem, um, if I, we have some Proper elementary extension G prime, let's say is V prime E prime. So that's a proper elementary extension. So the remember for an elementary substructure. Or an elementary extension, we use this curly less than or equals relation. Um, so I'm putting it this way around because G is the largest structure, sorry, G prime is the largest structure, G is the smallest structure. And I suppose because it's proper, I, I can do that. Um, I don't know if people do that. So let's keep this in blue just in case. But anyway, we know it's a proper elementary extension. V prime is a larger set than V. There are some new vertices in the larger graph. So let's have a picture of what's going on. Um, let's see. Maybe I'll put the picture on, on this panel here. Um, it might be helpful to have the picture actually somewhere else. Actually, no, that's uh... so we've got G, it's a graph, but let's just draw it in the bubble for now. And we've got G prime, which is a proper elementary extension. So you can simply view that as a larger graph. G is an infinite graph. G prime is a larger graph that contains the graph G. And because it's an elementary extension, it really contains G. There are no new edges in G prime between vertices in G. So there's a faithful copy of G within G prime. And it's a proper elementary extension. So there's some point, some vertex in G prime that's outside G. So let's call this infinity. Let's try it. Um, so that's just a name for the vertex that's outside. And what we're going to do is we're going to construct um, an iterative, we're going to make an iterative construction one step at a time of disjoint sets. Make an iterative Construction. So by iterative, I just mean we go through stage one, stage two, stage three of, of disjoint construction of disjoint sets of vertices. C and A, which are going to be sets of vertices in the graph, in the original graph G, such that at step n, C, or we could say C n union A n, this is C at stage n and A at stage n. The cardinality of that is so, so we've, we're distributing n vertices between the sets C and A, and the point is this is um, 
are we going to see? We're going to so at the end stage will always have n vertices in the set. Um, so C C is a clique in G. A is an anti clique in G. The point is, well, this is C sub n, if you like. A sub n is an anti clique in G. And the point is, we're, we're trying to find either an infinite clique or an infinite anti clique, and we're going to approximate it. So at every n, we're going to throw in a new element, either into a clique or into an anti clique. And by the end of the infinite stage, infinitely many stages, we're going to, one of these sets will be infinite, and it will either be an infinite clique or an infinite anti clique. How is the NA subset of uh, V, or is that a totally? This is this is V. The, it's the, the set of vertices. Sorry, yeah, this isn't curly, it's just right. yeah. This is just V, the set of vertices of the graph G. We have a V, we don't have a curly V, we have a V and we have a V prime. Um if anything, we're going to be curly, it would be G and G prime, because they're the structures. But this is the structure, this is the underlying set, this is the set of um, this is the interpretation of the predicate. I'm just writing more usual graph terminology notation here. Um, and the other thing we're going to require, as we're going to ensure as we construct, is that for all for all v in set C, then there's an edge from v to infinity in G prime. So we need to use the E prime relation there. And for all V in A, there is no edge from V to infinity. There is no edge from V to infinity in G prime. Okay. Um, so G and A are constructed as follows. Sorry, not G, C and A. C and A constructed as follows. C and A is a clothing shop, as you may know. It's still it's interesting because it was, an, I think, an old British company, but in Britain it went bankrupt like 30 years ago or something. But I was very surprised coming to Slovenia and finding that C and A still exists in Slovenia. <laughs> um, I don't quite know what the story is there. But... But it even has the same logo, so it must be related. <laughs> um, anyway, that's nothing to do with that. That's that's nothing to do with the proof. So CNA constructed as follows: um, for n is zero, um, we start off with the empty sets. So let's let's actually have some C and A in the picture. At the moment, they're empty, so there's nothing in them. But I'm putting sort of big bubbles around so we can. Um, so then we need to say what we do. Uh, so let's move the camera just a little bit. We need to say, uh, we need to say what we do um, at stage N. Sorry, well, we're doing that, but so when N is zero, C and A are empty. But for n greater than zero, we want to throw some element, throw in one element for each number. Um, so at stage n is greater than zero, we do the following. So let, let me, before telling you what we do, let, let me say what the general situation is. So we've put some things into C and they all form a clique. So we've got like some vertices in C, okay, like three vertices, we might have more, and they form a clique. And we've put some vertices into A and they don't <laughs> form an anti clique. So this is, by our induction hypothesis, we're going to have this situation. Um, and also, this property here means that when whenever we put things into, into C, we also have an edge in the larger graph G prime to infinity, whereas whenever we put things into A, we don't have an edge to infinity. Um, 
So we note that we first note that in G prime we have so it's true in G prime that there exists. The first order property, there exists an X such that the conjunction over, if we go look over all the vertices so far in the set C, there's an edge prime from X to B. And if we look over all the vertices in A, um, there's no edge prime there's no, sorry, edge from X to B, and X is not equal to B. So this is simply saying there exists an X that has edges to everything in C, and that it is different from, and is different from everything in A, and has doesn't have edges to anything in A. Why is this true in G prime? Why does there exist such a vertex in G prime? Which vertex enjoys this property? Yes, yeah, the infinity element, because so because infinity is a witness. I should have put infinity in my proof in my proof somewhere, and rather than just the picture. Um, so so consider some element infinity, which is just any chosen element from, from, from V prime to vertices of G prime that does not belong to the vertices of G. Okay, uh, right, so this is true. There exists such an X in G prime because it's true of infinity. But now we use the property that G prime is an elementary extension of G. And that means that G prime has the same first order properties as G. So since this is a, a first order sentence that does not specifically refer to, it, it refers only to elements in G, not to elements in, and in the existential quantifier, of course, ranges over elements in G prime, but the sentence itself, the uh, formula itself does not mention any elements in G prime. Um, so since it's also true in G, so since, since G prime is an elementary extension, extension, so this is where we're using the elementary extension property of G, the above, the above formula is true also in G. So that means there is some V, there is some vertex. Let's see what notation I use in my note. Um, I'm not going to write it out again. This is just simply true in 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 G. Um, so there is some element. So in other words, I.e., there is some element. U, which is a vertex of G, such that for all the vertices that we've got so far in C, there's an edge from U to B, and for all the vertices we've got in A, in the Anticlique set, there is no vertex from U to B, and U is not equal to B. Um, I went to put this on my picture. So we've got some, let's put this part in the orange, maybe, because this is, we've got some vertex U in G, such that it's connected to all the vertices in C, but it's not connected to the vertices in A. And now what we're going to do is we're either going to enlarge C or we're going to enlarge A to contain U. 
Can anyone see what the condition is? There's a, there's, a, there's a condition that tells us when to put U into C and when to put U into, into A. What well, like it's connected to the infinity version. Very good, yes. So we just check to see if U is connected to infinity. If U is connected to infinity, then it goes into C. If U is not connected to infinity, then it goes into A. Because it's still going to be an anti clique here. It's connected to these things, but it's still an anti clique here and it's not connected to infinity. Well, we need everything in C to be connected to infinity. So, so if. How do we know that U is not in C or in A? Um, so you can't be in C because so you so you satisfies these properties. It, it's it's an existential witness to this. It's a witness to this. So there's an edge from U to everything in C, and because there are no self loops in the graph, that means that U can't be an element of C itself. And here we've got the non equality. Here we've got an explicit statement that U is different from every element in A. Okay, so it's definitely a new element. Um, so if if there's an edge, it is an edge from U to infinity. Add U to A to C. Um, if there's not an edge from U to infinity, add U to A. So maybe I'll leave the picture like this. I mean, you know, that's the question. Let's, yeah, that's the question: Do we? Does that edge exist or not? And if so, you put you in here, otherwise you put you in here. Okay, good, we're nearly done. Um, right, so that this defines C and A at, uh, at every final, final stage. I stopped. I stopped putting these sub n indices, but I hope it's clear what's going on. We've got a C and A at stage zero, a C and A at stage one, a C and A at stage two, and so on. And each time we're just adding one new element to one. Um, So to complete the proof, it should be quite, I mean, it's quite straightforward now. So finally, we define C infinity to be the union, the union of all C's at finite stages. But that's simply, you know, we, we've simply been growing C as we go along. So we simply take, you know, everything that eventually went into C. We've similarly been growing A as we went along. So we take everything that went into A. Um, but A infinity is the union of all the A's. And at the end of that, just by the construction, we have that C infinity and A infinity are disjoint. Of course, the union is infinite because we've thrown in <laughs> infinitely many elements. Also, C infinity by construction is a clique, and A infinity is an anti clique. So because we, we've got two infinite sets, one of which is a clique and the others, sorry, we've got two sets, the union is infinite, one of them's a clique and the other's an anti-clique. We've got two sets and the union's infinite, one of those sets is infinite, so one of these sets is an infinite clique or one of the sets is an infinite anti-clique. So at least one of, at least one of A infinity and C infinity is infinite 
This gives the this gives the required infinite leak or anti leak. Have we done? Okay. Uh, Glorious. The, the... Anyway, uh, so the, the minute hand of the clock is now synchronized with my minute hand. Or an hour ago it wasn't, but maybe somebody's changed it. Or perhaps. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. It's an unbroken clock. Yes, who knows? Anyway, good. So that's the proof. We've, we've completed our proofs of the Ramsey theorems. Uh, let me just say the crucial point here. Is we we could be, I mean the, the crucial idea is using this proper element proper elementary extension to get a new element infinity that wasn't in the original graph, and because use and then using that element to guide us in our construction, and because the larger graph that contains infinity is a proper elementary extension, we can use first order properties that involve in. In fact, they, they rely on infinity in order to see that they hold to know that there actually exist witnessing witnesses in G to the statements that are witnessed by infinity. So we use infinity to as a guide to help us find elements in the graph G that we need for our construction. It's a very beautiful idea, I think. Um, and anyway, so that's. You know, if you do, I mean, I was talking to some people over the, over the break here, if you do a, um, a discrete maths course, you actually get a, a proof of a more general version of, um, you, you, can, you can basically prove the finite Ramsey theorem in a more general version by induction in about half a page. So you might, so this, in a sense, this is quite a lot of work. Um, but I think the ideas fit together really nicely here. And in particular, the way that one has, uh, an idea for how to prove results in infinite combinatorics using elementary extensions and how to derive results in finite combinatorics from compactness theorem. I think that those are very nice ingredients. Okay, so what I want to, we've still got 10 minutes for, for this part, but what I want to do is just quickly get the proof of the elementary extension theorem out of the way, and then the whole of the last part is going to be devoted to a different style of application of elementary extensions. Yeah. One where the logic is really essential. So in the case of these combinatorics proofs, it can logic can be bypassed by a suitable, suitable suitably clever proofs by induction. Um, in the case of what I'm going to show after the break, you can't bypass the logic. The logic is essential. Right, so anyway, I want to prove now just quickly before the break. So proof of the proper elementary extension theorem. Elementary. So I'll remind you what it says during the proof. We will see what we'll, I'll remind you what we're proving. And I better just refer to my notes just so I don't get off on some, some misleading notation. So we, we want to construct a proper elementary extension of a given infinite structure M. So, so let M be an infinite structure for signature over signature L. So. Now what we're going to do is we're going to expand the signature L to give ourselves, in just a very simple way, we simply give ourselves constants for every element of the structure M. So we expand L, signature L, by adding a new constant symbol, 
shall we call underlying D for every D belonging to the underlying set of the structure M. So we call this signature L sub M. So we're basically just adding names for all the elements of, of M. Um, so we're going to consider the theory of M in the language else of M. So strictly speaking, we're really considering the theory of the structure that's extended by adding to M interpretations for all the constant symbols here, where every, every new constant is interpreted as itself. But I hope you, you're, you can accept this slight abuse of terminology is the theory of the structure M in the new language of, of in which we've got the constants for all the elements of M. Um, but we need to expand the language a little bit further in order to get an elementary extension, a proper elementary extension. And to do that, we're going to throw in a new constant, infinity, which is going to be a constant that we're going to force to represent we're going to force it to represent an element in a new structure that's going to be different from any of the elements we already have. So extend L again. Extend L sub M signature to what I call L prime sub M by adding a further constant infinity. And you consider the theory set of sentences S, which I'm going to define to be again the theory of M as above in the extended language L of M together with so I put plus but it basically means union all the sentences D is not equal to infinity. So this is one such sentence for every element D. So, so for every constant coming from an element of our original structure, we add the sentence saying that constant is different from infinity. So essentially all we're doing is giving ourselves a rich enough language that we have a name for every element in the original structure M, and we have a new name infinity, and we consider the theory that says all the sentences in our new language that we can name every element in the original structure M that is true in M, we'll have a theory of all those true things, together with all the sentences saying that infinity is different from every element that we had in M. And it's very easy to see every finite subset of this set S is satisfiable. Because if you've got a finite subset, you only have you only have finitely many axioms saying that infinity is different from elements of your original structure. You only have for a finite subset of this, you only have finitely many constraints saying infinity is different from finitely many elements you had. And since the original structure was infinite, we can simply allow infinite, we can interpret it in the original structure by making infinity equal to one of the other elements. So since M is infinite, since M is infinite, every finite subset of S of S is satisfiable. Hence, by compactness, S itself is satisfiable. Pythagoras theorem from last week, if any, every finite subset of a set of sentences is satisfiable, then the whole set itself is satisfiable. So hence by compactness, every, so S itself is satisfiable. S is satisfiable. 
Um, and so it's satisfiable, so it has some model. So let curly N be a model of S. So N is a model of everything that's true about M, where we can name all the elements of M together with a new constant infinity that's forced to be different from all the elements of, of M. So you can, it's not very hard to imagine that N looks very like M, only it's got a new element infinity in it. The only thing is compactness has just given us a model. There's no reason that the underlying set of M should arise as a subset of that model. So we just, well, that's a very boring detail. We'll come to it in a moment. So first, what we're going to do is construct an elementary, a proper elementary embedding from M to N. So by its, by its definition, well, or rather, or rather since, uh, I think it's really by the definition of S, by the definition S function that takes any D in, in the structure M and maps it onto the interpretation of D in the structure N. So this goes from the underlying set of the structure M to the underlying set of the structure N is an elementary embedding. So elementary embeddings have to preserve first order properties, but the theory of S already states all the first order properties that contains all the first order properties that are true in M. And because N is a model of those sentences, those are also true in M. So it necessarily, this, this function necessarily preserves first order properties because N was, was identified as being a model of S which contains the theory of M. Um, so this is an elementary embedding. So now, and it's clearly proper, Because the element interpreting the constant infinity, so in infinity interpreted in the structure M, is forced to be different from all the elements of, of all the elements of, of M. It's not, not in its image. So Starting with the structure M, we've constructed an element, a proper elementary embedding into another structure. The only remaining point is that the underlying set of M, this is not, this need not be a superset of the underlying set of M, and this is not necessarily a subset inclusion. But that's a really boring point. We can simply rename the elements of M so that they agree with the elements of, of M. So by by renaming elements of M, elements of N, we can um, reconstrue the above function as a subset inclusion, as a proper subset inclusion And um, well, it's not an equal subset because it's proper from M into N, and therefore we get a proper elementary extension. So giving a sorry to go right down to the bottom of the board, a proper elementary extension. And that's the end of the proof. So sorry to go right down to the bottom of the board and almost right down to the wire, so to speak. So by my watch, it's one minute to 10 now. 
I shall give you a break until quarter past because that was a, a long period, that one. So I think we deserve a, a full break until quarter past and then we'll start again. Okay, let me pause the recording. Okay, so what, what I want to do in the last period here is just to give you a very, very minimal introduction to um, an area of mathematics that grew out of logic um, called non-standard analysis. And uh, those of you who are, are taking the logic course because you're not very fond of analysis, um, which maybe some people are, um, then I apologize to you. But anyway, this will be, I guess, the 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 only logic, the only, sorry, not the only logic, the only analysis in this course. And actually, we're not really going to, to go into, into analysis. But this is a beautiful area. And uh, one way of looking at it is to see the um, our the proper elementary extension theorem as a kind of crucial feature that is what enables this field to exist. This is not quite how it arose, but in any case, from a retrospective point of view, one can see the proper elementary extension theorem as, as a crucial feature here. Um, so before going in, into just to, two very, very simple features of non-standard analysis, I'm not actually going to do anything very interesting in it. Um, I maybe point you to some references where interesting things are done. I just want to give a, a little historical overview, which was to do with when the field of analysis was developed in mathematics. Um, I mean, in English, we distinguish between what we call calculus and, and what we call analysis. I'm not sure you have quite the same distinction in, in Slovene. Um, so calculus is kind of the practical mathematics of differentiation and integration. Whereas analysis is the mathematical foundations for that. Um, so calculus was developed back some centuries ago by Newton and, and Leibniz. And they developed calculus in a very heuristic way. They didn't really have the correct analysis mathematical foundations in place. Um, so the historic development of calculus by Newton and Leibniz Does Leibniz have a T in? I'm not sure. Oh, um, I'm not putting in a T in. I don't know. So he developed calculus, developed calculus um, using heuristic arguments. They weren't rigorous mathematical arguments using a concept known as the infinitesimal. So infinitesimals are like somehow real number quantities that are infinitely small, but not zero. Um, so such things were, were full of logical contradictions and also uh, not just logical, but also conceptual contradictions. And um, you have mathematicians and philosophers and um, clerics, um, wrestled with them for a long time and there was a big debate on whether or not they make they make sense or not so um so these seemed to lead to logical logical contradictions so there was a big debate on whether calculus actually even makes sense uh Obviously, it was very practically useful. One could, uh, well, one could actually calculate things that worked, like the orbits of planets and things like that. Um, so then, the, the situation was resolved in basically the nineteenth century by the development of modern style analysis using the the development of continuity and differentiability using this, this sort of epsilon delta style, as, as we often call it in English. So in the 19th century, problems were resolved by 
by developing analysis, basically. Develop, developing epsilon delta style analysis. Um, but this came into price, and the price is the sort of thing that frustrates students when they learn analysis, that epsilon delta style analysis proofs are very fiddly. You often, you know, in order to in order to prove your bounds, you need to work with um, epsilon over square root of two or something like this, and you have to find the right numbers that, 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 fit, it, that fit into your proofs, and it's, and it's, as I say, all quite fiddly, whereas the, um, the benefits of the original approach using infinitesimals was, in a sense, it was less fiddly, only the problem was nobody really knew what they were doing because of the logical contradictions around. Um, so what happened after the development of logic in the 20th century was um, Abraham Robinson, who was uh, a, a great American mathematician in the 19, maybe the 50s, but anyway, certainly in the 1960s, realized that actually mathematical logic could be used to resurrect in a consistent way calculus, the, the development of calculus using infinitesimals. Um, so Abraham Robinson realized that logic, mathematical logic, could be used to uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a word here, but it means to to fix the reputation of, to, to reinstate the reputation of, but I, I, the, the actual real word I want doesn't quite come to mind. Um, but in any case, it could be used to um, vindicate, that's it, vindicate non-standard analysis, vindi vindicate the development, development of calculus. Calculus based on infinitesimals. Calculus based on infinitesimals. And this is the field that is now called non standard analysis. And uh, I'm really not going to go very deeply into it at all, but I'm going to do the, uh, I'm going to do some very, very basic developments in non-standard analysis to show you how logic shows that one can make sense of infinitesimals. Okay, so that's, and there are quite beautiful textbooks on actually developing the whole of calculus using infinitesimals from the point of, as justified by as justified by mathematical logic. Um, in some places, some universities in the United States, they even teach undergraduates analysis this way. It's um, not, not in most places, but anyway, it is, you know, it, it simplifies some things, but actually there is a price you pay. So, and you have to be quite sensitive to logical issues in a way that you don't have to be if you do ordinary analysis. Anyway, the basic idea, so I'm now going to be more technical. The basic idea, and we'll do we'll do real analysis rather than complex analysis. So, so consider a structure based on reals. So, for example, we might have one of the structures we've been dealing with. So, the reals with zero one plus and times we can define the order we know that but let's throw it in just to just for the hell of it but we might if we want to add sine cosine e to the x uh dot 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 anything we like all continuous functions we might throw in doesn't matter. Whatever we do, this is an infinite structure. 
So by the proper elementary extension theorem, today's theorem, it has a proper elementary extension. You know, the theorem does what it says, it gives us a proper elementary extension. So by the proper elementary extension theorem, we have a proper elementary extension. Which would be we could call R star. So we've got some larger set with, with some new, not real number, but, but something that's in the elementary extension. Well, our zero is going to be the same as it was because this is an elementary extension, so it contains the original re re reals. Our one is going to be the same as it as it was. We're going to have a, an extended plus operation that operating on that extends the given one on the, the ordinary one on the reals. Extended multiplication, an extended less than, an extended sine, cosine, let's call it x. Anyway, it doesn't really matter what functions are putting in. But the point is, we've got an elementary extension, a proper elementary extension. Okay. And What, what happens is that, so this is guaranteed to exist by the theorem we, we've proved today. It turns out that any such structure contains infinitesimals, necessarily. And what does that mean? Um, so we can consider the structure of, so I'm going to prove a little proposition that examines the structure of our prize. Proposition. structure, oh, not our prime, our star, the extension of the reals. There are going to be two statements here. So the first one is there exists an infinitesimal, but what is an infinitesimal? So there exists some element E, not a real number, but in our extended real numbers, such that it's greater than zero. Well, maybe I'll stop writing the stars at some stage, but just to be pedantic, just to be careful, um, so E is an element of the extended structure, so our greater than relation on the extended structure is greater than star. Let's put the stars close to home. So E is greater than zero, and for every Epsilon greater than zero, where epsilon is actually a real number, E is greater than epsilon. Sorry, E is less than again by star epsilon. So this simply says we have our extended reals have an element in them that's positive, it's greater than zero, but is smaller than every positive real number. So this says E, so this is a definition of, in, this property is the definition of infinitesimal. E is an infinitesimal, infinitesimal, something that's infinitesimally small. And secondly, we don't just have an infinitesimal, but we also have infinite elements in our real, it's infinitely large elements. The second property is there. Are, there exists um, an element that's called infinity in our star such that for all actual real numbers x, so, so the infinite element is strictly greater than all actual real numbers, okay? That's an infinitely large element. So e he is, so this in this case we say it says that infinity is an infinite element. So we've enlarged our structure in such a way that we've got the real numbers in it, but we now also have infinitesimal elements defined in this way, smaller than every positive real number. 
a positive element that's smaller than every positive real number, and infinite elements larger than every positive real number. But crucially, this larger structure is an elementary extension, so the same logical properties hold of the larger structure as hold of the real numbers. For example, it is an ordered field. That's a property, those properties we can completely express using our first order formulas. Right, so I'm going to prove that, I mean, you know, that all we've got here from the definition is that we've got a proper elementary extension. We're going to prove that any proper elementary extension actually does have an infinite of both infinitesimals and infinite elements in it. So then we can see that this is really true. We're forced to have, as long as we've got a proper elementary extension, we're forced to have such elements. And then I'm going to consider one application of such elements to concepts from analysis. Um, Okay, so we're going to prove the proposition. We want to show that we have an, in, an infinitesimal element and an infinite and an infinite element. Um, so clearly, since the elementary extension is proper, R star contains some element not in not in the rings. I want to show that first we have at least one such positive element. So in R, we have the statement that for all x, if x is not equal to zero, then x is less than zero or x is greater than zero. Simply a formulation of the trichotomy property of the strict linear order on the rings. So since R star is a proper elementary extension, this first order sentence is also true in R star. So, so also true in R star because it's because it has the same first order formulas are true in R star. So that means our new element, well, it's obviously different from zero because it's a new element. So it is either negative or positive. So the new, so our new element is either negative or positive. But if we have a negative new element, then the negation of the negative new element will be a positive new element. So in the first case, in the first case, the negation of the new element is positive. So either way, we have a positive new element. So we have a positive new element. So I was saying we can negate any element in R star. Well, I've already said R star is an elementary extension of the reals, so it, in, it inherits all the first order properties, including the properties that the, that the reals are an ordered field. So R star is also an ordered field, and as an ordered field, it has a negation operation. Perhaps a feeling it has a negation operation, namely uh, an inverse to um, addition. Okay, so we have a positive new element. We now want to see that we don't just have a positive new element, we have actually a positive infinitesimal and we have a positive infinite element. So there are three cases. I don't seem to give the new element a name, so in my notes, so I won't. 
Um, I won't give it a name here. So there are three cases. And the first case is, well, it may just simply be the case that our new element is an infinitesimal. So if, so if the new element is an infinitesimal E, So then we've satisfied one, but we've got an infinitesimal. We still need to find an infinite element. Can anyone guess what an infinite, if we've got an infinitesimal E, can anyone guess how we define an infinite, an infinite element from an infinitesimal E? One divided by two. Yes, very good. Um, so then E to the minus one. So as I, as I keep on saying, R star is, is an ordered field. So as a field, we've got multiplicative inverse for non-zero elements. Of course, this is a non-zero element because it's new. So e to the minus one, one can prove that this is an infinite element. I mean, I won't take you through the argument, but it's rather intuitive that this is going to be the case. Okay, so that's case one. Case two is very similar which is if the, the new element that we're guaranteed to have is infinite, then, well, but then we satisfy two, we still need to find an infinitesimal, but in this case, the new element to the minus one will be infinitesimal. So two is uh, if the new element is an infinite element, Infinity, then infinity to the minus one is infinitesimal. If it's an infinite element, it's greater than every real number. And for any real number, that is then easy to show that that means it's smaller than its, it's multiplicative inverse is therefore smaller than any positive real number. So the third case is the interesting one, and that's the case in which uh, the given element we have is just some element of the reals, which is neither a positive element of the extended reals, that's neither infinitesimal nor infinite. Um, so in that case, well, if it's not infinitesimal, then it, there must be some positive real number that's less than it. So otherwise, we have we have a positive um, new element D that is neither infinitesimal nor infinite. So in this case, it's not infinitesimal, so it's not strictly smaller than every positive real number. So there is some positive real number that lower that is a lower bound to it. So there exist there exists a real number A such that A is below, whoops, sorry, A is below in the order on the extended reals, a new element D. Otherwise, D would be infinitesimal. Um, but again, D is not infinite, so that means there must be some real number that's an upper bound to it. So actually, there exist real numbers, A and B, both greater than zero, such that, but just to, I've already said real numbers, but just to emphasize these are actual real numbers rather than extended real numbers. So if D is not infinitesimal or infinite, it's sandwiched between two actual real numbers. 
So in this case, what we can do is we can consider the supremum of all the actual real numbers that are strictly less than D in R star. So define L to be equal to the supremum of the real numbers that are strictly below D. In our star. This supremum exists because it's a supremum of a set of real numbers that's bounded enough, bounded above by the number B. And the point is that once we've got this, this is like the closest real number. So every non standard element that's not infinitesimal or infinite, by this definition, we're defining a closest real number to the element D. And it turns out, then if we consider D minus L, you want its minus star, strictly speaking, and take, well, D minus L could be positive, could be negative, so if we take its absolute value, which we can do because we've got an ordered field, so this turns out to be infinitesimal, And once again, once we've got an infinitesimal, we take the reciprocal of that, and that's infinite. So in this proof, we, we used a bit of ordinary style analysis in the sense of supremum of a bounded set of reals. And the point of this proof is just to get things off the ground. We, I'm trying to prove that our well, I have proven, rather, that our set of real numbers, actually our extended real numbers, is, now we've got a, an ordered field of things extending the reals that contains infinitesimals, that have, has the same logical properties, contains infinitesimals, and contains infinite elements. The more interesting of those is that it contains infinitesimals, and what I want to end with is an example of how infinitesimals are used, like the, the most simple example of how infinitesimals are used to make sense of mathematics involve the kind of mathematics one does in, in analysis in a non-standard way, um, avoiding epsilon delta kind of definitions. Um, so I'm going to do that via another proposition. And uh, yeah, I think I've got time to, to even prove it as well. Um, right, so the proposition, the point is once one knows that one can have a structure with infinitesimals, which is what we know now, one can use infinitesimals to make nice definitions and to use these nice definitions to prove the, the usual properties of analysis and, and calculus. So what I'm going to do is just that one of the simplest things one starts with in, anal with, with in analysis is the definition of a continuous function. Um, so I'm going to do the non-standard version of continuous function. So, so suppose, suppose our signature at the start, um, our structure, contains a function f. So then a structure R, which is the one with the reals, then R star, our, our extended structure, contains f star, right? So for all the real, I've, I've actually rubbed the structure off, for all the functions we put in at the beginning, sine, cosine, exponentiation, so on, from, you know, there's, it could just be the list of all, all, all functions on the reals, as far as we're concerned. Um, we, we, have, we have versions of the functions on our extended structure, on, on our expanded structure R, because it is a, it, because it is an elementary function. And it turns out that the following are equivalent. Again, T F A E 
the deviation I'm using quite a lot. The following are equivalent. equivalent. The original function f is continuous in A. f is continuous at A. It's a particular point on the real line where A is a particular point on the real line. And secondly, the property for all extended real numbers, so for all x in the extended reals, if x is infinitesimally close to A, so in other words, if the absolute value of the difference x minus a is infinitesimal, then f of x minus f of a is infinitesimal. Now, if I were being really fussy, then this is minus star because it's in the extended reals. This is f star here. This is again minus star here. And it's really absolute value star as well. But uh, at this point, one doesn't, you know, once one's got the basic idea, you don't tend to be fussy like that. We basically think of our original structure as just being a substructure of the extended structure. And essentially, we've got the same functions on the extended structure. They just apply to the extended things. So that's why I put the stars in blue. I'm not going to really think about them anymore. So I'm going to prove this. It's a statement saying uh, the ordinary notion of continuity is expressed by this, this statement just using the notion using the notion of infinitesimal. How it's used if one's developing non-standard analysis is you forget the original no, the ordinary notion of continuity, and you take this as your definition of continuity. And again, there'll be a similar thing with differentiability. You forget the ordinary notion. There's another there's a there's a non-standard notion of differentiability involving infinitesimals, which is basically the kind that um, Newton and Leibniz, the sort of definition, it's very similar to the definition that Newton and Leibniz were working with. And for the other concept analysis, you do the same. You try and find equivalent notions, but you then, for the non-standard development, you take the non-standard versions as the basic definitions. So if you think about continuity, so here I'm not, you know, I'm not writing the original def the normal definition of continuity because you all know it, but of course this says for all epsilon there exists a delta such that um, if x is within delta of if x is it if x is within delta of a then f of x is within epsilon of of f of a. So it's a rather complicated statement, and that's the the, the usual definition of continuity in a non-standard case. This is quite an intuitive notion. It's saying continuity of a, of a single value function is about not having any jumps. How can you express not having any jumps? Well, the, you say, well, if you wiggle x just a tiny little bit, well, sorry, if you wiggle, if you move your value around a just a tiny little bit, you only take turn, turn the value of the function, you only change the value of the function by a tiny little bit too. So it's a rather intuitive notion, and it turns out to be equivalent to continuity. Right, so we have 10 minutes. So it's the following are equivalent, so that's five minutes for each implication. Um, good. Right. Uh, Take a deep breath time, and um, if we've got a bit more time, I would talk you through it. But uh, anyway, it's a nice proof, so I hope I shall convey some of the niceness of the proof. Um, so one implies two. Suppose f is continuous, and um, yeah, we want to prove that if x is infinitesimally close to a, then f of x is infinitesimally close to f of a. So suppose, so suppose um, x minus a is infinitesimal, the absolute value. And we want to show that, uh, we want to show that 
f of x minus f of a is infinitesimal. So to show that, we want to show that f of x minus f of a, the absolute value, is strictly smaller than any positive real. So um, to take any epsilon greater than zero, we want to show that. So, so here epsilon belongs to the reals, that's important. We want to show that f of x minus f of a is infinitesimal, so it's smaller than any positive real. We want to show that the absolute value of f of x minus f of a is less than is less than epsilon. So really this is less than star, but I'm, as I say, I'm avoiding stars now. So now we use that f is continuous, so by continuity, f at a, there exists a delta such that the usual stuff holds, so for all y in the reals, if y minus a, I'll just put for all y, if y minus a is less than delta, then f of y minus f of a is less than epsilon. So, so this, by continuity, that's true about the real numbers, so this is true in the real numbers. But because the real star, the extended ones, are an elementary extension, and because R R star is an elementary extension of R. Um, it's also true in R star. Okay, but since since um, since x minus a is infinitesimal, if we substitute x for y here, because this is true in our style, we can substitute x for y x minus a is infinitesimal, so it's strictly, it's definitely strictly smaller than delta, because it's strictly smaller than every positive value. Um, we have x minus a is less than delta, hence f of x minus f of a, the absolute value is less than epsilon, which is what we wanted to check out. Okay. So once again, it's, we have a property that's true in the reals, because we've got an elementary extension, it's true in the extended reals. And because that property is true in the extended reals, we get exactly what we want. Right. So that was one implies two, two implies one. I will move the camera in just a second. Q implies one. Um, so suppose two holes. Um, that epsilon be arbitrary. We need to show that f is continuous at a, so we need to show that there exists a delta such that for all x, x minus a, the absolute value, if, if x is within delta of a, so the usual definition of continuity at, at, um, at a. That's less than epsilon. So to do this, so we need to show this as a property of the reals. 
So let D, which is going to be like an infinitesimal version of delta. Well, again, let's not put the stars in. Be any, be any infinitesimal in. So obviously D is in the extended realms here. So if we've got any infinitesimal by property two, um, if we consider X equals A plus B, then we'll have A plus D minus A. Hang on, I don't seem to have A plus D in my notes. Oh yeah, so, so by two, we have that for all x, if x minus a is less than d, implies f of x minus f of a is less than epsilon. Because if d is infinitesimal, x minus a, if x minus a is less than d, then that's also infinitesimal. So, so by two, f of x minus f of a is infinitesimal. So if it's infinitesimal, it's certainly less than our epsilon because that's a real number. Because epsilon was assumed to be a real number. Um, so we've shown that there exists a d. So we've shown that there exists a z greater than zero. Um, such that this property, such that for all x, x minus a less than z implies f of x minus f of a is less than epsilon. We've shown this is true in the extended reals by z equals d, by a z equals d, because d satisfies that property. That's exactly what we've shown them. Of D. So because it's so since so this is true in R star, it's a first order property, so it's also true in R. Um so again, since R R star is an elementary extension of R, this is also true in R. So by this, I mean this first order property here. And that's exactly what we wanted to show, which is what we needed. So again, we, we use infinitesimal elements to establish the property in the extended reals, and then use the fact that we have the same logical properties in the unextended reals to what's called transfer that property from the extended reals down to the unextended reals. Um, so which is, is what we needed to show. Okay, and with that, that concludes, so that's the end of the proof. That concludes the lecture. I shall stop the recording.